Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar series here at BFG Financial Advisors. Uh, for those that are new and for those coming back, my name is Cody Niedermeyer, and I am actually the host of this webinar, which I'm very excited about, and I believe it's, uh, it's our 10th episode, so I like to pretend that I'm becoming a professional while doing it. But today we're going to be talking about It's Not Scary, Planning for Your Retirement in Your 20s, and we're lucky enough to have Eric Brotman, the founder of BFG, uh, podcast host of Don't Retire, Graduate, Graduate, excuse me. Um, welcome back, Eric. Thanks, Cody. This is always fun for me. I always, I, I'm, I'm enjoying watching you grow into a, a, a webinar professional host. It's great. Oh, we're both having a good time doing it. And uh, yeah. I think, uh, I believe the title of today's webinar is extremely fitting based on the time of the year that we're in with Halloween right around the corner. And there are a lot of people out there that think it is scary to start thinking about retirement, especially early. Well, it, it, it is scary to think about um, to think about ourselves in a condition where we're older and potentially frail and all of that. And I don't know about you, but when I was in my 20s, I was both immortal and had this incredibly long runway in front of me. Uh, and as I'll be celebrating my 50th birthday soon, um, I, I, I definitely have a change in perspective that comes over time. Um, but I'm also incredibly gratified that I got good advice when I was in my 20s and that even starting this practice and this career in my 20s, we were able to, to get to a point where I'm not overwhelmed personally by what's coming down the pike financially. I'm plenty overwhelmed and freaked out about what life might look like at the next <laughs> chapter. Um, and that's that's part of why I did the book and the podcast is trying to figure out what we want to be when we grow up. Like, I don't know yep. why we stop asking that. But in terms of planning for retirement, retirement's a terrible word to tell somebody 23 to plan for. First yeah. of all, that makes no sense. Because if you talk to somebody 23 that are like retirement, I'm trying to figure out rent. I got student loans. I got all this other stuff. Why in the world am I thinking about something 40 years from now? when I've got all of these uh, these things right in front of me I have to deal with, and they're not wrong. Yeah. There's The key is to figure out a way to do both, and I know we're gonna talk about some ways to do that today. Yeah, I think we're definitely gonna be able to provide some uh, some people with some tools that are needed to kind of take those steps to be in a situation, you know, like you are currently in, and like I'm currently working towards, because I am invincible still. Um, still, uh, still on the edge of the uh, 20, so I still feel I, that I, way. I, I saw you do a, a tough mutter, and you didn't seem invincible to me, sir. <laughs> well, a couple of days after, I didn't feel invincible either. That's right. But uh, without further ado, uh, I think we get this thing started. So everyone's favorite disclosure slide that has to be in the presentation. Um, and then kind of just a broad view of what we're going to talk about today is, you know, why is it important to start so early when you're thinking about retirement? Well, time is on your side. Mm -hmm. The earlier you start, the better the outcome is going to be. And there are lots of quantitative studies that have been done about this. But the simplest thing is just think about the rule of 72. Okay. The rule of 72 basically says that that you can determine how long it will take a dollar or any any unit of currency to double based upon your your return. So with a 7.2% return, which we are not promising in this webinar ever, but with a 7. .2, just for simple math, that means money would double 72 divided by 7.2 is 10. Money would double every 10 years. Even at 6%, money would double every 12 years. So if you have the ability to double an extra time by starting a decade earlier, that's a big deal. And I'll give you a perfect example. Okay. If you start if you start when you're 24 years old and money doubles every 12 years because you're doing 6%, again, mm -hmm. guaranteeing nothing, just using the math. That means that at 36, that dollar will be $2. At 48, it'll be $4 because the two will have doubled. And at 60, it'll be $8. So you essentially would be multiplying a, a and amplifying that dollar eight times by starting at 24. If you started the same exercise at 36, you would have half as much money because it would only double twice between then and 60. So why is it important to start early? That extra doubling with the rule of 72 is the one that pushes you over the top. And if you wait until you're 36, that doesn't mean you can't get there. It's still better to start at 36 than 48 in this in this simple example. Absolutely. But um, if you can start at 24 and then be consistent about it, 
it, it, it is a way to generate significant amplified results. Yeah, I think that's, that's a perfect segue kind of into getting more specific of how to do those things, but just the broad idea of, you know, starting today, a dollar worth or a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. And that accumulates over time and will really help you reach your goals once you set them. But I think that goes into the next section of, you know, when we're talking about 20 year olds, it's a lot of people getting out of college and just starting in their careers. You already made the point earlier of talking about how am I going to pay rent? You know, how am I going to go out to dinner with my friends on the weekend and afford that and pay my rent? And these people that say, I don't have enough money to start, you know, where can they begin or what they, should they be looking into to, to start planning? You know, from a very basic standpoint, in terms of the pecking order of things that you can do, reducing debt is generally always at the top of that list. Okay. Because if you're trying to build a mountain, you know, you're trying to climb this mountain, having debt means you're starting in a hole. You're not starting on the ground. So debt usually is first. There's some exceptions to that, though. So if you're a young, uh, a young person, you're out of school a year or two, you've got your first job, and there's a 401k being offered by your employer. And let's just say that the 401k says, if you put 6% of your salary in, your employer will put in 50 cents on the dollar. They'll put in 3% of your salary. Just, I'm, okay. again, I'm making this up because it's a simple example. Okay. If you don't do the 6%, you don't get the 3%. If you do the 6%, you essentially have gotten a 50% bump on that money the day you made the deposit, as long okay. as you stay with the company long enough to vest. And that's a topic we go into a lot in the book and in some of the some of the other materials. But if you change jobs every two years and you never vest in anything, then all of the employer money that was promised to you that was put in for you is no longer yours. You forfeit it. So it's important to understand if you're in a job that you think is really short term, maybe this is less compelling. But if you're in a job that you're hoping is going to become a career, um, it makes sense to start early. And the dollars that you put away, um, if they're matched, I would put that match ahead of almost anything else. It is the closest thing to free money I'm aware of. Okay. The free money usually doesn't exist. So take it when it's there. The other Absolutely. thing, the other thing that's important about this is um, if you're a 23 year old and you're putting money into a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k, which means you're foregoing a tax deduction because most of us at 23 don't have a tax problem. We have an income problem. We have a going out to eat problem. We have a student okay. loan problem. We don't have a tax problem. So at 23, if you fund the Roth 401k, you're using after-tax dollars, but then you can grow that money for the rest of your life without ever having it taxed again. Not the principal, not the gains, nothing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you need some of that money for your first home, there are rules that allow you to do some of that as well. So you don't have to make a decision that I'm putting all of this away for the next 40 years, 50 years. I don't know what life's going to be like in three years. There are okay. other ways to access things. So um, staying flexible matters. Beyond the free money of a match, however, I would say the only thing other than debt that's that's critical is that just have a simple emergency fund. Mm -hmm. None of us want to feel like we're one missed paycheck from oblivion. You yeah. know, if if you if, if you're in sales and you're commissionable, or if you're um, if, if you're doing something that requires you you're you're doing landscaping or you're bartending or you're doing something that that relies on on tips or on weather or on things where your income is not always stable. If that's true, having an emergency fund will help make, make sure that when you have a lousy week, that you can still recover from that. If you're on okay. salary, that's a little less likely, so long as your job is secure. But still, I think it makes sense to have a, a war chest because life happens. Suddenly, you need new tires for your car, or suddenly you need, you know, a medical bill comes up, or something happens, and you don't want to rely on Visa every time there's a, a crisis like that, because you'll wind up creating a different kind of debt that's worse than the one you started with. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's important to address now, I actually just pulled up a question from someone in the audience about uh, their employee contributions to their retirement plans. And the question basically, just to preface it, is what is going to happen to my employee contributions if they don't vest? But yeah. I think it's important to know that employee contributions so contributions that you make are 100 percent yours always, so don't have always. Yes. no there's there's no forfeiture of your own money 
Now, okay. you're, you're, if you're invested, your account can grow or shrink in value. I mean, some of that is just investment returns. But no, you, yes. a, an employer that's putting money in on your behalf, if you haven't been there for X number of years, whatever the vesting schedule is in the plan, would be forfeited. But every dollar you put into the plan and whatever it's grown to become is always yours. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to make that's that a, point. A, no, that's a, a really good question because that would be a reason to think about maybe not participating if you could have this taken away from you why would you do it but that's not the case good good great question thank you that's why i did not want to save that one for the end but uh moving on um you know first steps towards like you said we have the employer match um can you talk a little bit just about where you can gain access to the information about your retirement plans or benefits offered through your company uh because i think that is the starting point is you have to understand what is offered to you before you can really start moving forward Cody, you're right. And I, I remember my first job. Uh, you weren't born, actually. It's very upsetting. But but I remember my first job. You feel one, good. Of the, one of the first things that happened was I had this packet of stuff dropped on my desk. And it was here. We need these elections by Friday. And it might as well have been ancient Greek. I didn't know what the heck I was looking at. So uh, I did what any logical 22 year old would do. I went and asked my parents. What in the world is this and what should I do? Well, first of all, when you talk about the blind leading the blind, um, <laughs> our parents don't always understand this stuff either. And they certainly don't know what it's like being a 23 year old in 2021. I mean, they, they, there's a different, the world is, is totally different. Parents are not the best. You certainly don't want to hit the, the, the elbow of the person in the next cubicle or in the next office and say, hey, what'd you choose? Because everybody's lives are different. So, um, and and by the way, HR departments can help you with, with operational things and rolling, but they can't advise you on anything. They're actually not allowed to advise you. So you're left with this daunting task of where do I turn? And I think one of the things that's nice about, um, uh, about leveraging a financial advisor, even if it's your parent's financial advisor, is a lot of times they will at least talk to you and help decipher this and help you figure out um, what makes sense for me. And really, at that point, you're choosing health insurance. You're deciding whether you need dental or, or vision, which I, I frankly, most of the time I could take or leave. Medical's critical. Um, disability insurance, which in almost all cases we want to buy up because it's so inexpensive, especially for young people. And with that many years ahead of you, if something goes wrong, if you're in an accident and something goes wrong, you're going to need a paycheck or you're in serious trouble very, very quickly. Um, the life insurance piece, if you're young and single and don't have kids, um, if you get life insurance free from your company, that's lovely, but there's no reason to buy it through the employer. Um, and then there's, of course, the retirement piece. And the retirement piece is, should I contribute to uh, a plan? When am I eligible? Uh, and then how do I pick? What do I pick? There are all these funds. Like, what in the world? I don't. You're not expected to know all of that, but you are expected to make an educated decision. And so... Um, what a lot of 401k providers have done now, and this is true of 403bs and, and other other plans as well, the thrift plan for federal employees, but um, in a lot of cases, they now have either lifestyle or target funds where you can pick the year at which you think you're looking to retire. Now, Cody, what year do you plan to retire? I'm asking you this rhetorically because you may or may not know, but the reality is it's too soon in your trajectory to, to maybe have figured that out. So, just choose an arbitrary year when you're 65 or 70 years old and plan a target around that. You're just getting started. The decisions you make on your retirement plan when you're first getting started are not irrevocable. You can change them every day if you want to, please don't, but you could. And so um, I, it, it, it's just about getting started. So I consider the first round of your employee benefits, making sure you have the right medical insurance. If you're young and you're healthy and there's a high deductible offered, where you can have a low premium and you can fund a health savings account, go for it. That's a tax, um, it's almost a tax boondoggle, but it's legal and it's great. Um, and so if you're in a position where you can do that, do it. Um, but I, I think one of the first steps in understanding those benefits is getting some advice from somebody who really understands them and who knows you a little bit. And so if you have parents who are savvy or siblings or coworkers who are really savvy about that stuff, that's great, but don't be the blind asking the blind. Yeah. And to build off that, um, you know, with 401k plans, let's say you figured out your 401k plan and you're going to put X amount in, um, the idea of automation and kind of building this habit, um, can you speak a little bit to that and how automation of your retirement plan can help you reach those goals? 
Yes, I think some some of the idea of automating deposits, withdrawals, transfers, contributions, all those kinds of things, some of that autopilot is designed to make your busy life easier, but some of it's also designed to relieve you of psychological torture. And what I mean by that is if you had to decide, if you were funding, let's say you were funding $100 a check into your 401k, and you're paid 26 times a year every other Friday, so that's $2,600 that you're going to put in during the course of the year. And maybe there's a match, but that's, I'm using round easy numbers. If you were just doing $100 a check and it happened automatically, whatever you happen to see on the morning news or in the paper about the market did this or did that, or the economy did this or did that, or interest rates, yada, yada, all the noise, you'd be able to tune out a little bit. It really wouldn't matter very much to you. If on the other hand, you were collecting that $100 in some kind of jar, and every December 31st, you had to decide, am I taking $2,600 and putting it into my plan? First of all, this is a silly example. You can't really do it that way. But even if you could, you would then have to say, well, is this a good time to do that? Am I comfortable with this? What if I don't? What if I have these other things going on? And you would tort you literally torture yourself. It is unhealthy. And it, it, it is the, the best way to do this is to automate it. It is very simple to start at 20 or 40 or $50 a check or whatever it is, and then to say, you know what, I'm ready to go to 60 or I'm ready to go to 70, or I'm gonna do 6% now to get the match, but next January, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have it automatically move me to 7% of my comp in the hopes that if I get a raise next year, it'll then be a higher percentage of a larger number, but I'll still have a better take home. And mm -hmm. so it won't affect my bills, but it will affect my savings. And, and so the more you can automate from that regard, the better. I think it's kind of thinking out of sight, out of mind, but it's still something that should be reviewed, you know, two, three times a year just to make sure that everything's on track and you're still making progress towards those goals. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then building off benefits that, you know, there are a good amount of employers that are starting to include. And I think this kind of sneaks into the conversation about retirement is mm -hmm. the idea of estate planning and kind of the necessary stuff for estate planning for a younger person who says, I don't need a will, I don't have anything that is of value or anything like that. But there are other aspects to the estate plan that can definitely come up in conversation once, you know, you come to an age of majority or you turn 18. Um, stuff like, you know, medical power of attorney or financial power of attorney in different situations. So can you touch on those? Yeah, the, the short answer is if you don't have kids or assets, do you need a will? The answer is not really. I mean, you really, it, it, if if you drop dead tomorrow with no assets and no children, it, there's going to be some paperwork done by someone, even if it's at the courthouse. It's not the end of the world. Um, but as soon as you are of the age of majority, which in most states is 18, having your own financial and medical powers makes sense because while you're 17, your parents can step into your shoes and make medical decisions for you. They can talk to a doctor on your behalf. They can make financial decisions and talk to a, a bank on your behalf. Once you're 18, they can't. It's kind of like when you're in high school, your parents get your grades, but when you're in college, you get your own because you're an adult and they have to, they have to do some things to, to make sure you allow them to see them. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Once you're an adult, no one has the ability to make decisions and step into your shoes unless you give it to them. And it's important to name someone who can do that in case you're in an accident. If you're in a car accident or something and you're in the hospital and you need care and you don't have these documents, um, typically a physician will do everything in their power to just keep you alive. Well, some people would want that. Other people would be uh, less likely to want to be on, for example, a ventilator and breathing tube or feeding tube for the next five years. You know, and we've seen those. Those are horror stories. But even something simple like um, like you have to sign a, a new lease for your for your apartment, but you were in a bicycle accident. You both broke both your wrists and you can't sign anything. Just something silly. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or in in a better way, you're traveling. You're in Italy for three months. You, you know, it's it's a great trip. You're backpacking through Italy, and there's some things that have to happen with your bank account back home. Mm -hmm. You have to name somebody who can handle those things in your absence, whether it's because of a tragedy or whether it's because you're doing something great. Um, yeah. The will itself, uh, if you don't have children and you don't have assets, it really doesn't matter. I think a simple will is usually still a good idea, but once you've built any accounts or any assets that don't have beneficiaries on them, the will becomes important. Your 401k, your life insurance, all of those are going to pass. As long as you've named a beneficiary, they're going to pass that way. 
the will is less about property at a given point and more about who's going to care for important things. And, and by things, I mean your kids, not your stuff. Your okay. chafing dish is not, is not going to cause World War III in your family, I hope. But if you have a two-year-old, you need to name the person or people who are going to take care of your two-year-old if something happens to you. Um, and not only to take care of their financials, but to take care of them, to live with them, to get them clothes, to get them to doctors, to make sure they're in school. And if you don't name someone, the state will name someone. And I don't trust the state to, to do anything <laughs> properly, not just the state. If you have to rely on the government to do anything, just look at the post office. It doesn't work. You want to name the right people so that you can um, control that process, even if you're not able to do it then. Yeah. And another important note, I think, for this is just it's, it doesn't need to be complicated. I think these are very simple documents that, you know, if your parents have estate planning documents, those are conversations you can have with them of, you know, could I work with them? Or there's, it shouldn't break your bank to get these documents done. Oh, no, this should not be expensive. And, and quite frankly, depending on your family situation, you know, if, you're, if your family is of the type of means where they have a profound estate plan with, with a, a law firm, that law firm may just do these for the kids gratis too, or, or for a song. Yeah. So. Um, it's worth it's worth that is worth talking to your folks about um, um, if if you're if you have that kind of communication with your parents. Yeah, absolutely. And it could be a part of your benefit package, something to look into to see if maybe it's offered through your employer that they have some sort of agreement that can help you establish these documents. That's true. Um, and it's especially true for folks in the military, because yeah. uh, folks in the military have access to the legal services and all those kinds of things directly just as as being um, uh, military members. Um, and the same thing's true with most state or federal employees. In the private sector, it's a little bit less um, likely, but not impossible. And so it's worth seeing if you have a legal service that can help. Um, and even if you have to find this person yourself, if you ask for a referral to somebody, this is simple stuff. This should not be expensive. Yeah, absolutely. And I apologize to everyone because I kind of brought us down a little bit by talking about estate plans and kind of the bad stuff that will happen. So I'm going to bring it up a level. And let's talk about setting goals. <laughs> you, you just brought up estate plans while there was a a, a, a a tombstone on the slide. Oh, I know. I, that's why I had to be on there. It had to be. It's one of the things that has to be talked about with you know our clients or people in their twenties who are looking to retire. It's All part right. of the conversation that needs to happen. Well, let's have a little fun. Um, it, when we start talking about when we start talking about goals, there are lots of different kinds. Some people yeah. look at goals as a bucket list. Like during my lifetime, I want to do these eight things. I tend to discourage the bucket list approach because there's nothing worse than having a list of eight things you want to do, doing them, and then having nothing to do. And I know you could do another bucket list, but people don't. So um, to me, <clears throat> there are goals that are various types of life goals. Some of them are financial and some of them aren't. So if, if you have a goal that is to take a vacation and to do a, an African safari, that is both a life goal and a financial goal because it's going to cost money to do that kind of trip. And so you, you sort of look at that as a short term or intermediate term saving. Um, and it's good to have a plan around how to get there. Um, you know, the idea of financial independence and retirement is different for everybody. For some people, it's working two jobs instead of three. And for some people, it's a yacht in the Mediterranean. So not everybody can use the same definition. Your goals need to be uh, and you, you've heard this in business before, the sort of smart goal idea, mm -hmm. where they're specific. It's not my goal is to take a vacation every year because that doesn't that doesn't move you emotionally. It's better to list some places or to think about the kinds of vacations you want to take and really visualize it because it makes all of your hard work and all of your savings efforts better. Same thing with long term retirement. If if it is your objective someday um, to have a home at the beach or a place where your kids and grandkids, if you're blessed with them, are, are able to, to congregate or you want to leave a gift to your school or church or, or, or some other organization. These are financial goals. They're big goals. They might be 50 or 60 or 70 year goals. But the more um, the more you reduce them to writing and the more you really think about it, not because they're in concrete, they can change. Our lives change and therefore some of our trajectories, our goals change, but some of them you know, a really simple goal that I that I really like is to be debt free. Yeah. And by debt free, I mean debt free in an adverse way. If you have a house and it's got a mortgage on it and it's favorable, that's not debt. 
if you have credit cards and student loans and car payments and all of that stuff, to me, that's that's like a, a, an albatross around your neck. So yeah. being debt free is a great goal and being debt free by a certain age is reasonable. <clears throat> now, we're, we're in a, a world where, um, you know, the idea of retirement's changed. It used to be you worked for the same company for 40 years. You got a gold watch and a party. Um, you, you went off on your own. You watched TV for seven years and you were dead. Um, which sounds gruesome, but that's what it was. Today, people change jobs every two to three years. They're mobile. They move around the country. They do some things remotely. Um, they they create side hustles and do consulting and do other types of things. Um, and people want freedom. They want independence. And so uh, in most cases, it's determining when you can be financially independent is an incredibly important goal. What will it take? And how fast and steep do you want your treadmill to be? Because you don't have to replace 100% of your income to live well. If you're making a whole lot of money and a lot of it's going to taxes and a lot of it's going to nonsense, um, and nonsense is a technical term, but if that's what's happening, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for a very heavy lift if you want to continue to do those things. Yeah. On the other hand, if what you're looking to do is simplify your life a little bit and figure out what are the, what are the necessities and what are the niceties, if you can do it like that, then you're in a much better position to reach financial independence. And you know, if you've if you've talked to people about the fire movement, this idea of financially independent retired early, most of those people want to be able to uh, be in a position to not have to work. Most of them are working. Most of them love what they do. But if you're working because you love it, not because you need to make rent, it's a different experience at work. Yeah. No, I. Could not agree more. I think that's a great way to break it down and, you know, having those goals. Cause I know one of the first things I did once I started here at BFG was kind of create those measurable goals, have them written down and, you know, what steps I could take to reach you, every single one of them. And it keeps you on track. It really, it keeps you focused. It keeps everything right in front of you that you want and really helps you get there. But, well, and, 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 and I'm of the opinion that, that those goals should not be purely a dollar figure. Yeah. You know, this idea that I want to have $100,000 by such and such an age, or I want to have a million dollars by such and such an age. The problem is because of inflation, the cost of a dollar and the life choices you're making, a million dollars today is not what it was 50 years ago. And it's not what it'll be 50 years from now. So I, I would discourage people from saying, I want to have this much money by this date. Mm -hmm. What you really want to do is you want to replace your income, ideally entirely gross, net of your savings in an indefinite way. And that's a mouthful. And, you know, in the, in the book, don't retire, graduate, we go through those exercises in the workbook. We, we take folks through that so that if you want to try and calculate that yourself, it's, it's not difficult math, but it would be impossible to describe on a webinar right now. Uh, yes, but, but there are exercises that you can do to sort of figure out what's that going to take and when. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And, you touched on this earlier, but we definitely wanted to hit it over the head of, you know, kind of some examples or from your experience, what you've seen from, you know, people who have started in their 20s versus, you know, if I'm to wait another 10 years before I kind of start doing any retirement planning or anything like that. Just, you know, differences between those and how they accumulate other than this, you know, 72 rule or the rule 72, excuse me. Well, and, and I'm going to flip this this question back around on you a little bit, because um, we talked about what if I wait another 10 years in terms of the growth of capital, but I'm also going to say, what if I wait another 10 years to do things that are important to me? Because yeah. I, I think part of this is recognizing that we don't live in a world that is purely quantitative. This is not just a math problem. It's our lives. And we only get one go at this. So I've, I know a lot of people who say, I, I'm going to wait 10 years to take that safari because then I'll have more money. And then they either don't live 10 years or they're not healthy enough to enjoy it or they've their spouse has died and now they don't wanna go without him or her. I mean, all these kinds of things happen um, or their life has changed. They had triplets and now can't go. Um, yeah. I think it's it, once you have saved the amount of money or invested the amount of money every year that you need to be on track for independence, how you spend the rest of it is completely up to you. And so I, I know people who would rather go to a nice steakhouse once a month than go to a, a, a corner restaurant four times that month. Mm -hmm. That's up to you. I know people who would rather not dine out at all. They'd rather eat home because they can spend their money on other entertainment. They want to have hockey tickets or they want to go to the, the movies. Um, yeah. How you spend your entertainment, your fun money, 
truly is up to you. It should be the things that make you happiest. You can't do everything you want to do, but most of us can do anything we want if it if it's the thing that we that we focus on. So don't wait 10 years to take the trip. I'm not saying go be frivolous and, and eschew your retirement savings. I'm saying once you've put away enough money to be on track for the big thing, how you choose to spend the the what's left, don't feel the need to squirrel away every penny. I actually think that's kind of tragic. Yeah, it's sad. I know a lot of people who've built a lot of wealth and never enjoy it. And that stinks. I yeah. mean, you know, I, I then know a lot of people who blow every penny and are in deep trouble at a given point also. There's a middle <laughs> ground here. Um, I'm not telling people to go spend everything and hope that the government's going to take care of us. I'm also not telling people to squirrel away every penny and not to live now because you are younger and healthier and more, um, in many cases, fit and active than you will be in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. You should enjoy the things that mean the most to you, whether they're dining or travel or sports or entertainment or kids or anything. So I, I would tell you, don't wait 10 years to start the financial journey, but also don't wait 10 years to live your life. And you kind of gave a good idea. There's two spectrums of people that you see a lot of, of the people that are afraid to spend anything that they've made. And you got the people who spend everything. So I think it's definitely important to spend some time on, you know, who is there to help? Who can help you navigate those waters? And if you don't mind, just kind of walking through the proce or process of what you should look for in someone to help you as an advisor and what they have to offer to, you know, help you get those ultimate goals. Well, let's let's begin with the, uh, an abundantly clear fact, which is that not everyone needs a financial advisor. Absolutely. Right. We'd like to think that we can help anyone. And in lots of cases, I think in many ways we can. However, um, not everyone needs a financial advisor in the same way. Not everyone needs a trainer at the gym. Yeah. Um, but for many of us, particularly busy people and sometimes goal driven people or what have you, um, there's a, a tendency to benefit from an accountability partner. So yep. even if even if you don't need an advisor because your world isn't that complicated, sometimes having someone look over those things on a, a once or twice a year basis and really keep you on track helps you be accountable to say, yes, I did the things I said I was going to do. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that couples fight about most and that affects marriages adversely the most is money. And it's, it's because, uh, you, you know, a, two, a young couple you know, you're used to doing whatever you want. You know, you've, you've got your income, you're, you're living where you want to live. You're doing what you want to live. And someday, someday you, you come together and now you, you almost have to negotiate it a little bit. Well, if, if I'm buying this piece of clothing, then we can't also get that kitchen table or, you know, I'm making stuff up, but the reality is it may, it means there's a yin and yang. It means there's a push and pull here. So, um, I, I would say that it is incredibly helpful at a time of life change to consider engaging an advisor. That could be the loss of a parent or grandparent. It could be getting married. It could be having children. It could be getting divorced. It could be moving to a new city or getting a new job. It's the big life events that cause us to take three steps back and take inventory and say, all right, where are we? Because a lot of change, when it happens all at once, there'll be parts of it that don't get handled very well. And so... You know, I, I think there, there are lots of different kinds of financial advisors, just like there are lots of different kinds of lawyers or doctors or anybody else. Um, some financial advisors only want to work with, you know, super high net worth families. Others want to work with only a certain industry or a certain geography or a certain um, type of uh, executive or whatever it is. Um, I, I think it's important to find uh, an organization that is right for you. And I think it's okay to interview a few different ones when you're exploring, is this a good thing for you? Talk to a couple different firms. Where do you feel the right comfort level? I mean, if you and, if you and your spouse, and Cody, I know you're, you're not there yet, but someday if you and your spouse were to show up at a financial advisor's office, the conversations you're going to have together are really personal. And mm -hmm. you, if you aren't transparent with your spouse, or your significant other, and you're not transparent with your advisor, you're wasting your time and money. It makes much more sense to say, here's, here's what we're looking at. This is what's important to me. Make sure you listen to what's important to your significant other, figure Absolutely. out how they can work together. Because like I said, you can't, you can't do everything, but you can do lots of things. So sometimes that's a negotiation. There's a compromise in that situation and that's okay. Uh, but 
I think when you go to make a major life change, it's incredibly helpful to have somebody who has seen this before, maybe a hundred or 200 or 500 times. It doesn't mean they know what it's like to be in your shoes. No one does. But it means there are things when you when you fill out a questionnaire or put together the documents for a financial advisory consultation, um, in almost every case, the person you're handing that to has seen absolutely everything before that you're handing them. What they haven't seen before is that exact combination. Yeah. And so how the pieces work together and how you can uh, maximize your outcomes, I think that often requires uh, uh, um, some advice. And I think it also is helpful for you from an accountability standpoint. I, I think as soon as you have positive cash flow, um, and as soon as you have the ability to start making decisions about where to where to invest, where to put money, it makes sense to have some kind of advice. And if it's truly just the math, a computer can do that. There are yeah. apps that can do that. But if it's the human element, if it's if it's helping make decisions, you know, a, a computer doesn't know what it's like to save for a house. It can tell you, well, you need this much down payment, so go get it. It has no idea what it'll mean to get the keys to your first home or to pay for your son or daughter to go to college, particularly if they're first in their in their uh, family to go. Yeah. An algorithm can't figure that out. There's no way a computer can say, wow, that's really gonna mean a lot to, what the computer's gonna say is, well, that's a silly way to spend money. You ought to just go do this, or you can get a better return here. But the human side of it is what makes, I think the advisor incredibly important because, um, because these decisions aren't made by a calculator. They're not math, they're life. Yeah. And it's building that relationship with someone that you trust. And that goes back to the interviewing process of finding somewhere that, you know, think might be a great fit for you. Um, and you kind of briefly touched on it, but, you know, I know I've talked to clients before or friends, frankly, that financial advisor and all they think about is investments, investments, investments. Like you said, there's automation for that. There's systems for that. What other positives can a financial planner bring and what aspects of the world, you know, during the interview process, should we be asking financial advisors that they can help with? Well, I think there are a lot of people out there who, professionals who work with investments who, um, for whom that's their bailiwick, that's their thing. Yeah. Um, I happen to think most of the time, and, and an investment portfolio is important and people like to talk about it. Yes. It's often the least important piece of the financial plan. And I know that's hard and I know people don't expect that, but which growth fund you're in is generally irrelevant to your outcome. What you're spending matters, what you're earning matters, how to manage taxes matters, um, what to do when there's a tragedy in the family or what to do when families combine by marriage, um, what to do when you become a mom or dad. Those are the things that um, ultimately, that's where financial advisors are most valuable. And that's where you can't replace that with just math. So, you know, I don't want to beat this this horse too much, but, um, you know, the, the short answer is yes, investments matter. And yes, any financial advisor should be able to do portfolio management as a part of his or her um, engagement with you. But if that's all they're talking about, if in your first meeting with them, they say, let's see your statements, my opinion is run. Run, don't walk, because that is not the most important thing to you as the client. It might be the most important thing to that person as the so-called advisor. Yeah. But if this is about the advisor instead of about the client, run. This should be about the things that are important to you. It should be about financial, but also non-financial goals. It absolutely should not be, um, you know, here, slide me your IRA statement. Let me see, let me see how we should, you know, manage that immediately. That's, that's, you know, most of the time in our engagements, we don't even talk about the portfolio until the second or third meeting in because it, it, it's not that it's not important. It's that it's not going to change your outcome as materially as almost everything else. No, I think that's a great point. And, you know, we have received a lot of questions during this webinar from a whole bunch of different people that are viewing. Um, that's great. Do you Let's have do any ask thoughts? Um, based on our PowerPoint before we open up to questions. Absolutely not. Let's do questions. I, I always love to hear what's on people's minds. Let's do questions. And then I believe we have Sarah, our marketing director on the call, who's been uh, orchestrating all those questions and has pulled some of the ones that she might be, I think, are most relevant, which is scary, I know. 
Our QR code is a lollipop. I love that. That's Halloween. We're celebrating. It is. It is. <laughs> Sarah, are you there? I am. Can y'all hear me? We can. Yeah, we can. All right. So one of the questions, um, I think it kind of goes back to an earlier conversation in this webinar, webinar when we were talking or... about employee benefits and mm. things like that. What about the people who are self-employed or are entrepreneurs? Are there resources for them? Are there ways that they can start planning for retirement without having something like a 401k and a match and all of that? Well, the, the short answer is yes. There are a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs and self-employed people from a retirement plan standpoint. It could be as simple as just funding an IRA for yourself. There are uh, SEP IRAs and SIMPLES and all kinds of different plans that are a little beyond the scope of today's talk. But uh, the short answer is yes, self-employed people can not only build a retirement plan. In a lot of cases, they can build one and customize it to themselves and actually put away more money than you could if you were working for, for somebody else. So there are some true benefits on the retirement front to self-employment. Where self-employment is tricky is when it comes to insurance benefits, because it can be hard to get, you know, if you can't get group coverage for various things, you, you can wind up spending a little more money. And that that's not just in going out and getting your own disability insurance or life insurance, but it's also uh, getting your medical insurance and you'd have to use your state's exchange and you'd have to get your your own um, coverage or if you're married typically you would jump on your your uh, spouse's plan um, which is something that folks should look at once a year anyway is which plan should we be on but if you're if you're young and you're consulting and you're starting your own thing and you don't have health insurance you need to use the exchange in your state and uh, i would tell you not to wait another five minutes to do it Can we go really quick into that um, the IRA? Because I know there's Roths, there's SEPs, there's Simples. Is there one that is the best option for someone, or um, it, how much does that really vary? It varies a lot, and it matters based on a lot of variables, which is why there's no real quick answer. Um, and rules of thumb are dangerous. You know, I I, I hate to to throw out a rule of thumb right now that's going to sound like advice um, because I, I don't want to do that because I, I don't think that's necessarily helpful. Um, but if if pressed, what I would say is that the higher your income is, the more you need tax deductions. Mm -hmm. And the traditional IRA and the SEP IRA and the 401k, all those traditional resources tend to be funded with pre-tax dollars. And funding them with pre-tax dollars when you're in a high income situation is typically wise. That said, there are exceptions to that, um, particularly if you expect your income to stay that high long term or you're going to inherit money. I mean, there's exceptions to every single rule we can come up with. If your income is more modest and what you have is not really a tax problem, um, then using a Roth option, whether it's a Roth IRA or a Roth uh, 401k, means using after-tax dollars and growing them tax-free for the rest of your working life, and in fact, beyond. Um, that is a really powerful tool, especially for young people um, who tend to be early in their careers and therefore early in their income generation. You know, once you get to a, a certain income level, A, you can't contribute to a Roth, there are rules against that, but B, even if you could, like a Roth 401k, you, you might need the tax deduction in order to make your take-home pay work. So I don't think one size ever fits all. That's why there's so many options. I don't think there's a, a rule of thumb we can stick to like it was gospel. Um, I do think in general, if you're in your 20s and your income is um, sustainable to the point where you're able to make contributions, but it's not super high where you have a terrible tax bracket, Roth may make more sense than the others. Awesome. I'm just going through this list of questions. And if anyone has more that they want to send in, feel free. There should be a question box on your screen. Yeah, it's great that we have such an engaged group today. What else we got? All right. Um, another person um, is an entrepreneur, small business owner. Is there a way to make an advisor a tax deduction? <laughs> um, Technically, you need to ask the IRS or your CPA. Uh, I would say if your advisor is doing some business consulting for you as a um, as a business person, an entrepreneur, then to me, the answer would be yes. But I am not a CPA. I am not the IRS. And so like anything else, there's as much art as science to that. 
Um, I would say that if you're getting advice on how to handle things like your payroll or your HR or your benefits or things at work, then it's legitimate business expense. But um, I, I think you have to you have to rely on your CPA to to navigate those rules. Joe, do you want to add to that, or is that? I mean, I I think that's pretty spot on. But my mind started going a little bit somewhere else just based on everybody's favorite question right now about you know student loan debt and what should they expect based on taxes. Um, you know, in the coming months or what we've told, we're told on forgiveness. Uh, so if you could just touch on that, because I know a lot of people listening to this webinar, you know, people in their 20s looking at retirement, thinking, should I pay off my debt? Well, it's not accumulating interest. Kind of what should be my next steps? Well, um, I, I, loaded I think question. That, well, there's a lot of there's a lot of politics and a lot of psychology in that question because there there are two very distinct camps of thought. There's the camp of the or the, the camp that says you borrowed it, pay it back, mm -hmm. and there's the camp that says you borrowed it as an investment because you were promised something that maybe isn't real, and so maybe that's maybe that's something we need to find a way around. Um, yeah. I'm not taking sides in this debate. That would be a mistake. Um, what I will say is, in in my estimation, it's usually better to pay back the debts that you take. It's usually better to structure them in such a way that they don't become onerous for the, for you. I tell parents and young people to try and avoid student loans in the first place. There's uh, enough uh, resources and uh, and enough options right now. You can negotiate with with universities and colleges in a lot of cases uh, and say, look, this is what we're being offered at school A. If you want us to come to school B, you need to make us a better financial offer. And, you know, financial aid offices don't want the public to know that. But the truth is, like anything else you buy, there's a negotiation. They can always say no. But, you know, I, I think it's more important to figure out what your what your sticker price is really going to be. It's like buying a car getting into college now. So there's that. Other thing, real fast on student loans. There are a lot of people who say, I'm paying so much on my student loan that I can't afford to put money into my own retirement plan. And there are now programs that uh, that 401ks and other plans can incorporate that will actually allow if you demonstrate that enough of your income, a, a large enough percentage is going to student loan debt or payments, that your company will actually make a matching contribution or a contribution on your behalf into the 401k, even though you didn't, because you're paying loans. And so that's something to ask your HR department about or check your summary plan description and your employee benefits. But if you have student loans and you're making the payments and as a result, you feel like you're missing out on that 401k and specifically on the match, you may not be. There may be a way to, to navigate that anyway. Yeah, there might be a good opportunity for it. You make another great point. Uh, Sarah, I think we got time for one more. You have uh, one more for us? I do. Perfect. All right. So. For people in their 20s, people that are young, how important is a credit score and how can you improve yours if it's not very good? I think a credit score is incredibly important because so many of the things, so many of the decisions we make when we're adulting involve uh, involve underwriting financially or from a credit standpoint. So it, whether it's whether it's negotiating to buy a car, whether it's buying a home, whether it's um, whether it's getting it's it's amazing that young people can borrow with no no collateral at all to go to college, but then you need to prove all these crazy things in order to borrow for almost anything else. And I think that's part of the problem actually with those. But um, the credit score is important, and there are three credit bureaus in the United States. There's Equifax, there's Experian, and there's TransUnion. Um, you're allowed to pull your credit reports from each of those bureaus once a year for free. Um, there are also resources, credit monitoring resources. You can, some of them are free. Uh, some of them have a, a cost to them because they also have some identity protection and other services. Um, if you're just starting out and there's no reason to believe you're going to be a victim of some kind of fraud, you know, you don't have a, a family member looking to steal from you or something, then usually you don't have to pay for this. But just something simple like a credit karma um, can make a difference in terms of tracking that. And it, it'll provide you with some, some uh, intelligent advice around things you can do. Um, in general, um, one of the things you can do to make sure that your credit is solid is to make sure as soon as you're 18 or as soon as you get off this webinar, if you don't have a major credit card, that you get one. And by that, I mean typically a MasterCard or Visa. I'd also include American Express in there, but get one because one of the components of your credit score is the duration of your credit history. And so for people out there who've never borrowed a nickel, 
and they're 30 years old and they've never, they've never had a student loan. They've never had a car payment. They've never, and now they want to buy a house. Their credit score may be lower by the fact that they don't have a credit card that they've had for 10 years that they've demonstrated they can use responsibly. So it's an interesting thing. There's also, um, there's also a lot of junk out there on credit reports. So when you pull them, you might find that you went to some department store or some, I, you know, some, some electronics store six years ago and you, you wanted a 10% discount. So you signed up for their card. Well, that's still on your credit report and that can actually cause problems. So the major ones you want to keep, the minor ones you typically, unless you're going to use it a lot, you typically don't want. And there's so many benefits to credit cards. I mean, and, and you can customize them for what you want. I know there, there's like a whole industry around how to use points, but if you're, if you're into travel, you can choose your airline or you can choose your hotel chain. Um, you know, you can, I, I mean, I happen to think that the best credit cards, particularly for younger people right now are the cash back cards where you get one or 2% back on everything you do. It's just a discount in life. The caveat is don't ever carry a balance. They're only a good thing if you pay them in full. If you get behind or you're in a position where you're suddenly paying 9 or 10 or 12 or 15% interest, you are not doing yourself any favors. So use a credit card like it was cash, pay it in full every month, and build your credit history. Um, and if you have a major card, uh, whichever one you've started with is the one you're going to keep because um, it is important to, to maintain that credit history. Now, if you have a card you got when you were 18 and there's no real benefits on it, you can go get a second card with the cash back or something and use that one primarily. And that's fine. Again, just make sure you pay them in full. It will, it will actually help you buy a home if you have more credit history, so long as you're not carrying debt or, or missing payments or, or having issues. Okay. That's a great question. And there, there's actually a whole section uh, in, in Don't Retire Graduate about that and about ways to clean that up and, and what to do if you really get in trouble. I mean, there's, there's a lot of resources out there and some of them are free and are really helpful. And some of them have a cost and are really helpful. And some of them are fraud and it's hard to tell the difference. I mean, there are predators out there. So it, knowing the difference makes sense. And, and there's a whole piece in there to try and help folks with that. Well, thank you, Sarah, for all those questions that you put together for us. We, uh, we really appreciate you keeping track of those during the webinar. Um, and as everyone sees on their screen right now, we have a QR code up where if you actually hold your phone up to it, you can set up a free consultation with one of our lead advisors here at BFG. If maybe we didn't get to one of the questions that you asked during the webinar, or you know you have some other things that you think you might need some help with, uh, please don't hesitate. Set up a meeting. We'd love to talk to you. And um, other than that, Eric, as always, thank you. You know, it's it's we're so lucky to have somebody like you. Uh, to come on these webinars and, you know, provide this advice for people who, you know, don't know where to find it or don't know that they even needed it. So once again, thank you for coming on. And your reward for that is we're going to bring you right back ne uh, November 10th. We're going to have you on for our next webinar uh, where we're going to be talking about, um, you know, preparing your assets for retirement and the important decisions as you get closer to that date. So as always, thank you. My pleasure. You nailed it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, of course. And then everyone have a great Halloween and we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks.